So James, tell us a little bit about your background and how you actually became SVP and head of data product at Pluralsight. Yeah, sure. Um, so I've had a lot of experience with data-driven product experiences in the past. And um, I'm a product guy originally, and I think it, it's actually pretty healthy to come into the data science world from a, from a different angle or a different domain than um, just pure, pure data science. Um, so I had, had you know, a lot of background with different innovation programs. My first product was an innovation program at Staples um, in, in North America, rolling that out to sort of 90,000 um, associates um, and getting ideas back from, from everybody at, across the company. And that was my first taste of product. So um, there was a ton of different data points in that. It was a very data-driven organization um, to the point where we probably were too blinded from, from the data that we didn't listen to the voice of the customer all the time. Uh, and we did some very clever things, but we also did some things that, you know, like our, I ran the business card line for a little bit and um, the substrate on our free business card was just really, really bad. Um, and, I, and I love it. We, we made a huge amount of, um, you know, uh, difference in the world there. And it's, it, it was an enormous experience growing that company out. But, you know, our core product, our free business card was like just an atrocious substrate and people wouldn't come back. And you're like, why are they coming back? The data says they're not coming back. Well, you go out and talk to them and like, oh, wow, look, it, it, it just doesn't, um, doesn't work. And, you know, we, we, we went out there, we did all the hard things, we did to the marketing, we got them in, we got them, we sent them the business cards. Let's just make the substrate a little bit better. So you did the, the math and look, it was about, you know, a million dollar upgrade to, to upgrade them to our next best substrate. Um, and then the repeat rate just had to rise by like, it was just a small little um, margin to just to break even. So we did that and lo and behold, we, it did much better than we thought. Um, and then we, then we had to have a review of why we didn't make that decision earlier. It was just because we were so data orientated and so numbers based that we hadn't listened to the voice of the customer. So we needed to put those two together. And tell us a little bit about how you got into Pluralsight. And for people that don't actually know what Pluralsight is, tell us about what you guys do and some of the challenges you overcome. Yeah. So as I was saying, I was looking at how um, Fidelity came up the learning curve and the, the various opportunities out there for um, technology learning generally. And I was amazed by Pluralsight's technology. It's, it's, um, you get an enormous uh, catalog of content. There's 7,000 different courses anybody can do at Pluralsight. Um, and what's really interesting to me as a, as a technologist or as a, you know, a product guy who's come into data science is um, it's a true opportunity for machine learning AI techniques. So we, which we're, we're trying to do is match the individual needs of a learner, which can be myriad and totally bespoke to that individual coming in, um, depending on their skill level, where they are, what company they're at, um, where they are, you know, they come, you know, experience of whether they're trying to make a career transition or they're trying to learn something brand new out of school. Um, there's so many different use cases for a different, for a different learner. Um, and then how do you match the exact right content to that learner? And then beyond that, it's like we have so much content out there, but we're, we've always got content that needs to be refreshed or there's new technologies that need to be covered or covered in a different way for a different type. Um, so how do we get the right author to make the right content at the right time and incentivize them in the right way? You're trying to work it. You're trying to actually position yourself as that end user and trying to think how can you actually give them the right information at the right time on their journey at that point. So imagine, I mean, imagine if you had a, a teacher who knew everything about you and had access to almost an entire um, perfect set of um, educational content and just had to match that you know, your need for that content was able to do that instantly on um, a global level. That's what we're talking about with the opportunity for artificial intelligence at, um, you know, at Pluralsight. And that's what I wanted. I wanted a company where AI really makes sense. So it's not just, we're not just doing it because it's cool. We're doing it because, you know, there's an absolute use case for it. So you're not just trying to find a problem. Exactly. And then, you know, then I was talking further with, um, Nate Walkinshaw, who's, who's um, the chief experience officer, and he was like talking about the process that they use here at, at Pluralsight. Side. I, I just love it. It's continuous discovery of um, customer needs. So we're talking to customers. Um, 
increasingly we're going to be using more and more data analysis and data techniques to also understand the voice of the customer is revealed through data. But then we, and we launch continuously too. It's continuous delivery. So I have um, six or seven small teams in, in my organization that just launch to production every day. So James, tell us a little bit about that in terms of the team dynamics and somebody that's constantly releasing something versus somebody that doesn't release that often and the mindset that's involved and also the cross-functional teams. What, what, did that, what does that actually look like? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting and it's... Um, one of the, the coolest, the, you know, the most exciting environment I've worked in probably in my career is, you know, we have small teams. Like I think I have six or seven small teams that are sort of continuously launching to production, but they're also continuously discovering too. So they're constantly talking to customers. They're looking for, um, you know, trends within their, you know, qualitative discovery, but they're also increasingly looking at, at data to reveal that voice of the customer too as, as people use plural site in different different ways. Um, but the teams have uh, a, a product person, a, a designer. Um, there's usually three or four software engineers or potentially a, um, a machine learning engineer or a data scientist. Um, often with my teams, a data scientist assigned. And they'll just launch to, they'll release to production three or four times a day, potentially. It depends on what um, what they're working on at the, at the point. It doesn't always necessarily have to be a product three times a day, but it, they'll be pushing stuff into production to then reveal later on, but they're sort of getting it ready to go. Um, it's fascinating. And the, the thing is, I don't, you know, there's no like approval process from me. It's like we, we have guardrails in place to make sure that, you know, it's not um, going to be anything that's detrimental to the experience, but they can autonomously move. And we put a lot of trust in our teams, you know, like to make the right decision, to make the right call um, and move effectively. Um, and which is very, which yeah. is very, empower, which is very empowering, empowering for employees because they're seeing engagement, they're seeing changes kind of every day. They're kind of seeing, there could be little features that are kind of increasing usage, increasing success of uh, the, the, the test scores, for example, or completion mm-hmm. of the... Um, their, 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 their courses so they can actually see these things in real time which is which is really really engaging and then the user always feels like some new innovations are coming through so I'm guessing you probably have a really nice feedback loop if people are giving feedback at any moment from the customer journey yeah we're, we're all looking at different metrics to ensure the success across the board um, but yeah as a whole we're, we're you know we're metric driven um, trying to work out how to make our experience just just be as optimal as we possibly can and from a, um, a data science viewpoint, we're starting to form the sort of data strategy that you know, what we're trying to optimize is, is time to skill acquisition. So how do we start measuring that and building that in and being able to quickly identify? And we can do that through our current data science and Iris. Iris is sort of the, um, the AI personification throughout our, uh, our experience. So I think we, we kind of spoke with this off air where I was saying to you that data science at the moment is, again, one of those uh, jobs that everyone's talking about is recognized as one of the best jobs consistently in all the different reports. And then I'm speaking to data scientists and they're telling me how dissatisfied they are with the role. They're a data janitor. They're working with management that just don't get them, don't understand them. They want results very quickly. They're trying to make the move from academia to industry and the different challenges there is in terms of communication, ROI. Um, there's so many different challenges to that. And then you kind of talk about having a really positive experience, cross-functional, managing that, managing it for certain outcomes, while also understanding you're going to fail every day. How did you go on that journey? Because it, sound, it sounds like a pretty good journey for a lot of people uh, to be at now, but it, for some it can be several years before they can actually feel like they've got there. Yeah. It, there's, a, there's a huge amount to say for the culture of Foresight. Like, it is not just something that we have on the wall. So when I first turned up here, it was actually the summer party and um, people were just unsolicited coming up to me and talking about how important the, the core values of this company are and like, you know, being honest and open and transparent and then tr- creating with possibility. So, we, we, you know, we're trying to, to do stuff that humanity's never done before. We're trying to change the way people learn. Um, and that gets people excited, right? So, you know, you build that, that sort of shared sense of mission and it's we all know what we're trying to do the mission is clear it's we're democratizing technology skills so you know 
I feel like it depends on the environment that data scientists are going into. Um, and there's a lot of people who, who don't really understand AI and its limitations and what, how it works from machine learning, how it works um, from an executive sponsor viewpoint too. So you need to sort of understand you know, the, the path that the leadership's come from and have they really understood it or are they just doing it because, hey, somebody told them that they need to do AI to look innovative. Yeah. And B, in those areas, that's when you, you get a lot of dissatisfaction with various, um, you know, various data science environments. Yeah, so, so that kind of starts with the candidate going in for the job interview or job, or just asking about the mission, the culture, the executive journey to actually using AI and why they actually want to do it. Uh, we talked earlier about actually trying to find a problem rather than actually going in with a specific idea and a plan to, to do that as, as well. How hard was it to look at what you're doing day to day and think about innovative ways where you can actually apply AI, AI to you know, genuinely give a better customer experience either internally looking at kind of key metrics and externally looking at the experience of the user to, to learn faster, more exciting, more enjoyable journey? Yeah, so I, I think at plural side, given the way we, what, we, what we do and the way we drive, um, my biggest task here is working out which one of the very many worthy projects should we work on and how do we, how do, we do that in an optimal and, and sequential way that makes sense. Like how do we grow quickly? Um, because we have so much opportunity in the AI space or the machine learning data science space. Um, we have a lot of plenty of opportunity in all, in all different aspects in, in plural side at the moment, which is great, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's about, um, the setup of the entire, you know, what the product is meant to do. And, and this product has a whole bunch of matching, um, elements to it. And when you start really, if you want to, and this is what I've, how I broke it down for senior leaders at other places is are you trying to predict something and do you have a historical data set that helps you make that prediction in a more um, accurate way or are you trying to trying to divine insight from enormous data sets and can you use uh, like a clustering analysis or um, natural language processing or something like that to to be able to um, derive insight from enormous um, data sets that, that humans can't sort of do it otherwise. So we, the answer to that for plural side is yes, on both sides. Um, there's definitely a prediction element and there's definitely a, sort of a deriving data inside and listening to that voice of the customer so that we can build a better experience again. Do you see many changes in the customer journey now in the next three to, I don't know, I was gonna say three to five years, maybe a year to three years down the line in terms of how we're gonna be kind of engaging in content and how we're actually going to kind of continue to, to learn because the thing about innovation and tech is it's just moving so, so quick that if you don't stay ahead of it, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's going to be increasingly in demand and it's, it's sort of the pace of languages that, that come on the market at any one point, some from a technical viewpoint, you know, like it, you know, 20 years ago, there was sort of only a, a couple, a handful of different coding languages, but you know, new technologies and new methodologies come out every day. Um, so that pace of change is increasing. So how do you keep up with that? You need to have that sort of technology learning platform that can do that. Now, what people are looking to from us in many ways is guidance on what should I learn? You know, like what, what should I learn today in order to stay ahead of where the industry is? Um, we have a technology radar that, that is helping to um, you know, identify trends within certain different practices or, or coding languages um, to help with that decision. But um, as we see certain trends arise, it's probably going to be up to us to be able to predict um, and, you know, promote those learning opportunities, learning journeys to, to learners throughout the industry um, in order to make sure that they are ahead of the game rather than sort of playing catch up, which I think is given our data sets and what we've been doing for the last, um, you know, since our history of, of starting Pluralsight is um, an enormous potential for us to be able to, you know, you just log into Pluralsight, hey, here's where you were, here's where you were yesterday, but also here's where you can be, you know, three months down the line. You know, like how, how, did, how does that learning journey map out? Yeah, and people want to know about that lear uh, learning journey because then actually it feels like they're going on a course that's going to actually give them uh, or keep them ahead of the game uh, rather than actually doing something that's going to be 
uh, finished or old. And that's one of the challenges by doing a kind of a four-year course is by the second or third year, the first two years are redundant, right? So it's, 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 a, real, it's a real challenge to say the least. Uh, you're listening to AI Mentors. My name is Mark Kelly, and we're speaking to James Alward. James is the SVP Head of Data Product at Pluralsight. James, just my final question. Kelly, what advice would you offer to companies trying to integrate AI into product development and where they want to do it, but they don't necessarily know the journey to go on? Yeah, it's, I, mean, I think there's a recognition when you, when you start out um, that it will be a little bumpy at points. Um, and I think having that maturity is, is crucial to begin with, right? So that's, that's the start. Um, then you've got to recognize that if you're, a, if you're a company that's used to building your own products or integrating off the shelf products, that th this will be different. Like data science, and particularly your first, the first attempt at data science, it's a lot of groundwork you've got to, you've got to lay down. You've got to work out um, a whole bunch of different you know, tech stacks that you're probably not used to. And then, um, then if you are successful, how do you, how do you bring those models into production? Because we're seeing a lot of that too, where we can successfully build models but putting them in production and, and um, having somebody to look after the care and feeding of, of those algorithms in production and, and over time is something that, that companies have never done before and not used to. Um, I, I would strongly recommend that people work out the uh, potential ROI. So if your um, AI or machine learning project is going to change your industry or change substantially change the user experience, it's probably worth doing. Um, but if it's only going to be very incremental, you might want to think again about it. Yeah, because um, so. there's, there's, there's that unknown element, right? And people have to understand there's that unknown element because compared to like your regular scrum engineering cycle, those yeah. things are mature. So this yeah. is this is this is the unknown element, and you need to be aware of, be aware of that on that journey starting out. But I think this is a, actually a really fascinating. Um, product development philosophical philosophy debate is how do you do this? How do you, how do you integrate um, data science in a meaningful and effective way into teams that are used to running um, very quickly in small, in small teams with high certainty of, of technological feasibility. Um, and the way we've, I've seen it work um, effectively is the data science team is all in there. They understand the context. They're in the upfront. They talk to customers. They, they understand the business challenge that's required. Um, but then they go away and there's sort of a R and D stream, if you will. So they're, they're working at the data sets, they're looking at data, they're building out the testing hypothesis the team has. Um, and then they come back and say, Hey, look, you know what we thought we could do. We actually can't do that. But here are four or five other thing, things that we can do that we didn't even know we could until we opened that data set. Yeah. And then it's up to the um, product manager and the designers and all the rest of it to take advantage of that opportunity and see whether, oh wow, look at that new superpower we have over there. Does, do people want that? Is that something new? Yeah. It's, it's, it's always a really nice experience that when you go on journeys one end, work out that it's useless, but then you actually figure out you found out the real problem, <laughs> which is so, so much better. You're it's like, yeah. just start. Like, get something go prototype because you're never gonna you're never gonna learn quicker than when you stick that first prototype in front of the customer yeah yeah it's kind of like that vista print example again it's like you were thinking you're doing a good job but until your actually customers are giving you the feedback and actually saying to you this isn't what we want we more like this it's just such a it's just a wide eye-opening experience that everyone just benefits from just just spending that time and figuring that out james thank you very much for your time today you know, whereas it's been great. Thank you. Thanks very much.